This week on Merchants of Change, we've got Shane Peterson. Shane played Division I baseball at Cal State Long Beach before playing professionally with the Cardinals, Athletics, Brewers, Rays, Padres, and Dodgers before transitioning to sales with Clumio. Today, he's an enterprise account executive at Clumio, a leader in simplifying organizations' data protection on AWS. Here he is, Shane Peterson. I'm JR Butler, co founder and CEO of The Shift Group, and you're listening to Merchants of Change. This is a podcast about transferring the skills and behaviors we acquire as athletes and military veterans into becoming a professional salesperson. Each week, we'll introduce you to a top performer who will help us understand how they became professional merchants of change. What's up, kid? Today, we got Shane Peterson. Shane, great to meet you, man. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, of course. I uh, appreciate you having me on. I'm excited. I've been looking forward to it. Absolutely. So for a little bit of context, um, we started our podcast to, to really create content and learnings for the folks that we work with, right? We help former uh, elite athletes and military veterans successfully transition into B2B sales careers. Um, we've been doing it for a couple of years and, and our, our audience has grown significantly. It includes that type of crew of folks that are considering sales as a career path. It also includes people that are new to sales. And then, you know, recently we've, we've really been growing the audience of you know, kind of seasoned salespeople that are that are getting a lot of great mindset and tactical lessons from these conversations. We always kind of follow the same path. We will talk a little bit about your athletic career, hear kind of some of the challenges that you ran into in your transition, some of the lessons you learned, and then we'll we'll kind of spend the last third of the conversation around all the stuff that you're you're picking up as a sales pro. Sound like a good plan? Yeah, sounds great. Awesome. All right, great. Um, I always start like really broad. You, you obviously had a very impressive baseball career, so I'm excited to hear your answer here. If I asked you to talk about your favorite memories of your athletic career, where does your where does your mind go right away, Shane? It's always that initial kind of professional draft, right, where you've got family around, you're watching on TV. I was fortunate enough, I can't really remember back then whether they aired the first round or what, but, you know, I was in those discussions. So once they got even to the website, though, and you hear your name called and your family's right there with you and, uh, you know, knowing that they've gone through as much as you have, really, like, to be honest, like, yeah, it's, it, it means the world to you, but it means the world to your parents, too. So, yeah, yeah, that 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 is such a. It's a special day for not just yourself, but like you said, all the people that helped you get to that to that point. Um, I was talking to our producer before the show, and he was telling me you had a story where uh, you got called up against your old team and and had a, had a had a had a great uh, great experience. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, as far as on field memories go, that that's always the one that jumps out to me, just because. You know, you've always, you hear the stories, Aaron Rodgers and, the, you know, Tom Brady's and the whatnot, they got chips on your shoulder, on their shoulders. And like every athlete has kind of a similar thing. So uh, this was really, it was actually my last stint up um, playing against the Oakland A's who I was drafted by the Cardinals, but I went over there after a year and I spent five plus years there. And, you know, it's, yeah, I could have done better, but I also did well enough to get in my opinion, do, you know, more big league time, a little bit more. I only had two days with them. So you know, anyway, after a couple of years of being gone with them, I was with the Rays and we're doing our West Coast swing and playing, playing in Oakland in the Coliseum. And I was the 25th guy, very much so. Like it didn't matter how I did. I was filling in for guys, but I played Saturday night and we were Sunday day game, off day the next day. But I... It was 0 for 3, top of the ninth, tie ball game, 3-2 count, runner on second base, kind of what you almost dream of as a baseball player anyway. Uh, 
base hit to right field, go ahead, run scores. We win by one. You know, you're doing the interview, you get the the bucket dumped on you, and you're just everything that you can imagine I got, which is phenomenal, right? Like that's that's why you play the game, that's why you continue to play the game and grind through and grind through. And then I always have to mention after that Sunday day game, I think we were playing at like 10 o'clock because we had a three hour flight back or not three hour flight, uh, six hour flight, three hour time difference, you know, back to, to Tampa. And I'm not playing. And I know this the night before, uh, despite, like I said, I, I went four for four one game and didn't play the next day. Like it's just part of being a bench player, right? Just kind of know, but I'm sitting there. I think I had a Red Bull in my hand. I got sunglasses. I'm chilling on the bench. It's the top of the first. Steven Souza Jr. is leading off, playing right field. He gets a base hit, steals second base, and gets hurt. Like, not bad, but hurt enough. And next thing I know, Cash is like, hey, Peter, you're in right field. And I shot up like, oh, son of a, not stretch, not mine, nothing. So, you know, partly my own fault, but also, I mean, come on, I'm, I'm riding into the off day, just uh, maybe I pinch hit, maybe whatever. Um, go in there, get four at-bats, four strikeouts, just the worst you could possibly imagine. Only player in race history to ever strike out four times in a game he didn't start. You know, I got that on the record books. Maybe that's changed now, I don't know. But, you know, it was just total life ex- uh, experience, baseball, sales, everything. You're at your high couldn't do any better, couldn't be feeling better about yourself. And then 10 hours later, I'm just struggling on a six hour flight back home. <laughs> so, Oh man, that is, that yeah. is like, that's sports I, in a nutshell right there, dude. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I, I, I hate to say, I hate to tell the story, but I love to tell the story, because, you know? Yeah, no, it's, listen, like that's resiliency is a muscle. Shane, right? Like that's, that's the, yep. that, that type of experience makes you, you know, it sounds corny, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. So you you look at the way, like at the time there couldn't be a, like, I couldn't have been more down, right? I couldn't have thought that this is the biggest mistake of my career, biggest, whatever. And then you flash forward even um, a week later, a month later, now, what was this? Seven years ago. It's, a funny story and you don't even think twice about it. So it's always bigger in the moment. Yeah. 100%. How would, um, looking back on your baseball career, Shane, how do, how do you think your teammates would describe you if, if they were asked about you? Yeah, I was always a clubhouse guy. I loved being in the clubhouse. Um, I got along with everybody in some way. Uh, even the guys that nobody liked, would, I would be the, the guy that would kind of be their friend, which is good because – you know, some of those guys were the best players on the team, you know, like you, you got to make sure that um, they've got somebody in their ear, somebody who they can rely and support on. So, uh, but I was always too just led by example. I was never a big rah, rah guy. I still am not a big rah, rah guy, right? It's uh, Hey, this is what you got to do. Um, this is how you do it. People come to me and say like, Hey, is this okay? I'm like, no, it's not okay. Why, why would you think that? But, um, and also just, again, especially later in my career when I was in AAA and I've got uh, you know, 12 years of, of AAA time, basically. And um, a lot of young kids, the game's gotten super young now. So try to just be that mentor. Yeah. The, the becoming a veteran is a, I saw my, my brother do it, right. My brother played 14 years of professional hockey and was like, you know, those first couple of years, you're the rookie, you're kind of like learning the ropes. And then you always have guys that step up and show you the way. And then, you know, we, we talk a lot about it in our business. It's like, first you learn, then you earn, and then you return, right? And, and I think we see athletes do yeah. that, that stick around for a long time. It's, it's always good to give back to that next generation. Um, talk a little yeah. bit. Uh, now, yeah. did you, you did 12 years. Did you have a plan of what life after baseball was going to look like? Talk a little bit about your, your own personal transition story, Shane. Yeah, I had zero plan. Um, it's one of those things where as you start to get older with, I mean, in baseball, right? When you're 32, you're a miracle that you're still uh, on the field in any sport. But I've known for, I had known for years that like, hey, like I'm pretty much done. Like, what am I going to do after? But one, it's hard to give up the dream, right? Like, hey, I'm still getting contract offers. I'm still playing. Um, and I want to focus on this. But two, I don't 
really know what anything entails. And so that's, for me, a big passion of mine now is hopefully not what I love what you all are doing, you know, especially in the sales side, but getting together just a different, like a bunch of resources to let players know, and not just players, right? you got military, you got even college kids who it's like, hey, what do I want to do? And understanding what that is day to day, because that's what I didn't know. I didn't know what sales entailed day to day from year one to year 10. I didn't know what an accountant was. I didn't know all these things. So I just, it was hard for me to make that uh, first step. And so until I actually did that in sales, it was, you know, it's kind of going with the flow, which when you're trying to make a decision, the only bad decision you can make is no decision, I think. So. Yeah. Yeah. We, we see, and I think you followed this path. A lot of guys will go and do coaching for a little bit as like a stopgap. Is that, is that kind of how you ended up as a coach for a little while? Yeah, it was very much, uh, you know, one, I liked working with kids, you know, I like, cause I don't love teaching the mechanics of things. I think it's, you could have you know, any number of people who, who like to do that. But I think that there's a huge gap in baseball with the, the mental side, right? Like where to be, how to, to play, like what to, how to prepare all these things that I enjoyed now trying to do that with 10 year olds is a little, a little bit more difficult, but I still did, uh, you know, some lessons and individual stuff that paid the bills while I was, uh, while I was trying to figure out, I had to go back, finish school. So you can imagine 12 years after, um, college, not many credits transferred. So I had, I had a lot of makeup to do, but, um, again, I still love being around the kids. I, I loved that age, loved, um, helping them out. How, how did, uh, how did sales come across your desk? Like, like, how'd you find it? Um, and, and talk a little bit about like those early, those early lessons that you learned as a, as a new sales professional. Yeah. I always like to say that I, I tripped and fell into it, right? Face first wasn't, I didn't know. It's one of those things too. Like I didn't know what sales really was. Right. And there's, there's a difference between software sales and medical device sales and car salesmen, right? There, there's a lot of the same ideas, but again, the day-to-day -day is different. Like how you think about things are different, but I just had a few major life events that happened all like boom, boom, boom. And really was like, Hey, just do something, right? Like just make a decision. Like I said, that's the only thing you can't do is not make a decision. So I finished my LinkedIn was, and I was about to graduate like the next month. I had a recruiter reach out and said, Hey, I got this, this sales job that the hiring manager wants specifically wants former athletes. Uh, he was a former NFL <laughs> linebacker for the Arizona Cardinals. And, you know, I mean, pretty simple process to go through, but man, talking about, learning things on the fly early for sure is you know, it's just a completely different same mindset, but also applied in such a different way from sports, you know? Totally. Yeah. The, 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 the parallels between the mindset is undeniable, but to your point, like you're not, you're not in the gym, you're not, you know, throwing the long ball, working on yeah. arm strength. You're like, you're practicing account research, you're practicing your messaging, you're practicing yeah. objection handling, but like bringing that athlete, like high rep, high energy to that new, this yeah. new like group of skills and concepts. That's why guys like your first boss look for guys like you and me and, and, and former athletes and yeah. military veterans, um, because it is so similar in the mindset. Yeah. Um, and the resiliency, yeah. the resiliency to the story you told earlier. Like you are going to go 0 for 4 yeah. on Monday. And guess yeah. what? You need to come yeah. back on Tuesday and get ready to get right back up to the plate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think even too, it's the understanding that like, hey, yeah, the, the, the more you do, the, the you want to ideally be able to have a 30 second memory, but also understanding that like, hey, when you've got a bad day or a bad week, like don't, don't expect you to just like not everybody, I don't expect myself to just all of a sudden be like, I'm good, right? Like there are some things that you got to do and realize like, hey, just make sure that my 0 for, you know, I just went 0 for 10. Make sure that doesn't turn into an 0 for 30, right? Like, you know, yeah, maybe it turns into an 0 for 15, but just don't like, don't let it drag out so long that all of a sudden you can't make up for it. So, um, you know, understanding that just because you know that you want to get back into it doesn't mean that you're going to go suddenly 10 for 10, <laughs> but. Absolutely. 
what what did you find like early on Shane what did you find from like sports that immediately translated for you to like helping you as a salesperson like what were some of the traits and skills that immediately translated for you a lot of it for me was of course you got the main things that we all think about right the discipline the drive the ability to um really have a goal that you don't give up on despite how unattainable it may seem at the moment but really it's not everybody has that capability to be honest like i shouldn't say that everybody has that capability but it takes years and years of practice and so that's what sports in general it gives you know us former athletes in particular since that's what i know such an advantage is that the fact that we've spent years decades probably longer in training those muscles to actually apply that because it's everybody can do it but it's not easy it's definitely not easy so um the just the many years that we've got of building that muscle as you said doing doing those things that yeah. translate to not just sales but really life in general but sales is is a key one I, I, I'm also curious to get your take. Like one of the things that I found as an athlete to be a superpower for me was like maximizing the time that I had, right? Like, cause as athletes, mm -hmm. we come from pretty structured environments, but for much of the off season, it's kind of like, Hey, you have to go get better this summer. So like, we'll, or, or in your case, this yeah. winter for baseball, yeah. um, we'll see yeah. you next year. Can you talk a little bit about how that played out for you as, as like somebody that walked into a career that's fairly, it's fairly ambiguous in terms of like how you're expected yeah. to spend your time. The, the right. outcomes are by no means ambiguous, but how you get there is did that, yeah. did that background in athletics help you there? Yeah. So I was very fortunate. My very first coach in pro ball in short season was, he was a little out there. He was a little nuts, DJ. He, uh, but he had some really good nuggets if you're paying attention, right? And you really like took into what he had a ton of experience. And one of the things that he said that really stuck out to me, very first bus trip from the uh, Buffalo airport down to Patavia was, you know, I'll help there. I'll help you. I'll be there for you. But I'm only going to care as much about your career as you do, right? Like, I'm not going to care more. I'm not going to care less. So, I, the way I took that was like, hey, all right, I've got to do this. Like, I'm, if I've got the offseason, I come into the season and it's clear that I didn't work. It's clear that I didn't do anything. That next spring training, like the guys that did that, like he, you know, didn't really help a ton. And so understanding that you are responsible for your career. And I can't say there's any like set structure that you can really look at and take into that um, offseason, but just the mindset of knowing that this is your career, nobody's going to be able to make you successful if you don't want to be successful yourself. And that just helps give you the, the motivation, right? It gives you the why of what, why you're doing stuff in the off season when you don't, aren't told to. I love that. I, I wrote that quote down. We only, we only care as much as you care. That's awesome. Yeah. Such a good yeah. piece of advice. And it applies to business too, I think. Yep. Um, really good. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if you get these calls. Obviously, I've gotten a lot of them. That's why I started the company. But like, if a senior from Long Beach calls you and they're interested in sales, what does that conversation look like, Shane? The first question I'll always ask is why. You know, you, you may not know why. You know, it may just be something that is you see other people do it. But you know, you have to have a why. Like that's such a big thing. And no matter what you want to do. Um, and if you're wise, you want to make a ton of money, like, honestly, like, great. Like that's, that can be a huge motivator in sales for a lot of people, but, um, you know, it's, you need to know that you want to do this. And so I try to give them a very clear, like, Hey, this is what I do. Being an SDR sucks. Like it just, it's not like, you know, you're in rookie ball, essentially just sitting in a clubhouse with cockroaches all around you. And, but then you think about the fact that like, Hey, if this is what you want to do. And you can get to an AE and be a, you know, an enterprise AE or get into leadership. Like it's, there aren't many better careers than this. So, um, but 
making sure that you're going to spend a year, two years, maybe more as an SDR. If you don't want to be into sales, like you're just going to, it's going to be three years of misery for no reason. Yeah. And, and, and I like that. Um, we, I hear a lot is the financial reasoning, which I actually like, I'm okay. I'm okay with a sales rep that's financially motivated, right? Like as long as it's like truly in their bones, right? Like I didn't grow up with a lot. I want to have a lot. Like that's candidly, yeah. like I'd say my first five years of success, that was what drove me. Um, yeah. but if, the, if I would say like, even if you have like a great why about sales, and you're not financially motivated, I always tell people like, hey, if you're okay making like a mediocre salary, don't do sales because yeah. you're, it is yeah. not worth it. Like it is way too hard to just go exactly. and collect a mediocre paycheck for, you know? Yeah. So 100%. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the way um, I look at uh, a lot of things and like, I, I, say, I love sales. Um, actually, like there's a lot more to it than I ever thought, right? Like, you know, there's a lot more theory to it. There's a lot more um, to put into practice. There's just a, a ton more than I ever imagined, but it's also affords me a great work-life balance most of the time, right? Like I get to go do as much as I enjoy sales. I get to go do the things I also love to do because one, I can work remote so I can go visit family and work out there. You know, I have the weekends where I can afford to go play golf, right? And so it's, um, it's important to, Look, you, you've got to, whatever you do in your career, do what you love, but also do what gives you the ability to then go do what you love. As long as you enjoy it, at least a little uh, bit. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, uh, I always tell people I love sales. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons I love sales is because it's a career that you build around your life and you don't have to build your life around your career. Right. Like it's yeah. the, exactly. to your point, it's, the, those first two years, like you're just going to have to suck it up a little bit, but like if you earn it and you get to the spot that you're in and that I've been exactly. in where you're, you're a, like a true, like high ticket enterprise type of seller, you, you're, you're writing your ticket yep. for exactly like you're going to be able to coach your kids. You're going to be able to play golf. You're going to be yep. able to go on the trip that you want to go on to. So it, it can really unlock a lot of that value in your life that you can't get in other career paths, even other career paths that make a lot of money, like being a doctor, being a lawyer, yep. working on Wall Street. Yep. Like those are all yep. very high paid, yep. paid gigs where you essentially trade your time for money. Sales is not that situation, yep. you know? Yep. 100%. Um, and yep. Any, anything else that you would add about like, like, so let's get into like the, the tactical side of sales. Like what do you love about the actual job change? Yep. Yeah, so I got into software sales in particular because I, I love the tech side of it. Like I part of what I considered getting into was just IT in general. Um, now, yeah. and this is where former athletes have a huge uh, benefit. Right. I, I was talking to MLB, the Players Association has a phenomenal career transition uh, resource program. And I ended up only kind of doing one uh, session, but it was very much the like, hey, you're going to be applying to these maybe IT positions and you have, yeah, 12 years of baseball experience, but that really doesn't translate well. You're going to be going up against kids who are fresh out of college with five years of internships at Google. And, you know, you're going to, it's going to be hard for you to even get past the automated process of it where you look at sales and your experience is catches somebody's eye immediately. And I get to stay involved with the tech community. I get to learn new products. I get to learn things that um, are super interesting to me because I know for me, and I've, I've always known this, but especially the last three years, if I'm not passionate about something, I'm not going to sell. Like I'm going to sit there in my chair and be super monotone and quiet and it's just not going to work. So that's the, the tech side of it. And I didn't realize when I was playing because you're around 30 guys, at least in the baseball clubhouse, almost 24 hours a day for six months. And so I always thought that like, I just want to go do something, close doors away from everybody, because that's what I did after clubhouses. Cause you needed, I needed to recharge that way. But when I got done playing and I realized like, man, I don't have this social aspect anymore. I don't have, you know, I'm not talking to people, you know, COVID didn't help that situation, but 
um, sales is very much one, you're building a team atmosphere with others around you. At least that's how I do. That's why I like kind of smaller companies, but also you're building champions, right? You're, you're going out and now things are getting more in person, but you're, you're helping other people. You're talking to them, you're texting them, you're doing all these things that give you that social aspect that I didn't realize that I was missing, but you know, it's, it's a huge part that I enjoy. hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, I guess like to, to close it out, Shane, we always ask every guest, um, we talk a lot, like people always ask me, JR, why do you guys focus on athletes and veterans? And my answer is always the same. It's like, these are people that know how to get dialed in. And I think we all have a different, we all have a, a, a high level understanding of what that means in sports and the military mm -hmm. for you. What, what does being dialed in mean as a sales professional? Yeah, it's very much, right, you get those blinders on, you get focused to where, you know, what, what baseball movie was it for love of the game? I think it was where, you know, he locks in and all the noise around him goes away, right? You don't have all these distractions. Um, and even at times, and that's so huge when you've got things that you don't want to do, right? As an SDR, there are so many things that you don't want to do. Like, I don't know how many times where I'm just tired and I'm like, I've got a cold call, a list of 500 people. I'm like, do I want to do it? No, but I dial in, right? Like figuratively and literally, but like I, I get this dialed in and put my blinders on and I just do it. And not only do I do it, but I do it well. And I think that's where athletes have this ability to do things that are hard, do things, those hard things well, and do them consistently. Because, you know, when, when you're not focused on all the outside noise, what you're doing is your, your primary, you're putting all of your skill, all of your effort, all of your talents into it. 100%. I love that answer. The blinders, baby. The blinders. Kane, this was an awesome conversation. <laughs> yeah. Man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. our show. We really appreciate having you on. Of course. Yeah. Like I said, I was, you know, I reached out to you all because I'm just so um, you know, passionate about what you guys are doing. And I wanted to get on here and I wanted to, you know, always love sharing my story, what it can help people. And um, you know, hopefully, any anybody watching this can take a few nuggets like I did from my my old coach and you know even just one thing over the the thirty minutes is uh, worth my time. So I, I'm I'm very likely going to steal that advice you got from your coach and and lead our training. And <laughs> listen, we are only going to care about your career as much as you care yep. about your career. I love that. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. And Thank and the other part of that too is you know all care. You know, I'll care as much as you do. So, you know, if, if you want to hit in the cages at 1 a.m. after the game, like, I'll be there for you 100 percent, you know, so sign me up, baby. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yep. Thanks for joining us. Of course, man. I appreciate it. This wraps up this episode of Merchants of Change. If you enjoyed this episode, the most meaningful way to say thanks is to submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in working with us, please come find us at www.shiftgroup.io.